Everywhere we go, people want to know who we are and where we come from. So who are you and where do you come from? I'm Louise and I'm from Swords. Louise, hi. Hi, Rebecca. (laughs) You and I have had conversations before. We We have. And I just wanted to bring you back and sit down um, because, you know what, we had lots of people saying to me that, you know, they loved the little snippets and it's not to say that we loved like your your grief story, but people like they resonated with each and every story that we had. Um, So I just think it's usually important to sit down with you and just hear your story from start to finish um, and then talk about some absolutely amazing work that you guys are doing. That is called a sip of support. Yeah, and um, when we'll talk about that at the end, um, both and the retreat that's happening as well, which yeah, I'm usually really excited fun. about for you guys. Um, so talk to me, Louise. Tell me about you. Okay, so um, well, I'm 41. Do people need to know that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you look 31. <laughs> Great. Uh, now I grew up in Swords, so mm. small little village. Um, and when I grew up in Swords, it was a village. So everybody knew everybody. And my dad ran a bar in Swords for 20, I think it was nearly 25 years. So everybody knew me. I could do nothing. And that's like a running joke between me and my friends that I could do nothing. Mm. Uh, when I was 18, my parents moved to Drogheda. So I also then you know, branched out and I know loads of people in Drogheda and have a How life. How old were you when he was in the pub? Oh, from the age of five, right? Oh, really? Up. Yeah. So, like, I would be, I would always remember walking home from school, and we used to, me and my brother, I only have one brother, and we used to come up by the doors of, it was Joe Ryan's, it's not even there anymore, it was yeah. in front of the castle. And you'd be going past the window looking in to see would he come out and give you a pack of crisps, or could you go in for the, like, the little bottle of orange, or, yeah. you know, but it was just, they were the nice things, and he was, he was an amazing dad. Yeah. And we had, like, a tough childhood. Like, we didn't have it the easiest in the sense that, what child in the 80s grown up in a working class family had everything that they wanted it wasn't it wasn't like that but we had every bit of love that we could possibly need and like we had our tuesday nights and we'd always go into the savoy he, do, he loved bringing us to the mm-hmm. cinema so it was we had a really good upbringing and it was lovely um so we moved to drahada in 2002 and he left the pub. He he moved. We like he he retired. He just he couldn't do bar work anymore. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyway, so we moved to we moved to Mornington. So it's just on the coast of Drogheda, mm-hmm. and that was his dream. This was his favorite place in the world. And him and my mom had worked so hard. They were re- like they always had like there was always two jobs and making sure things came together. Like it wasn't like lavish like lavish holidays and that. But mm-hmm. we had everything we wanted. But they'd finally got to Drogheda. They finally got everything coming together. And in 2005, my mom, my dad and myself went to Boston on a holiday to family. And we had a fabulous week. And we had actually gone. There was 10 of us that had gone and everybody else had gone home. And I had booked the trip. So I booked us an extra two nights. So everybody else went home on the Sunday into the Monday. And we were still there on the Monday. And uh, I like to tell this story because, well, other people would be like, that's really arty farty. But anyway, I'll tell it. I was in Boston with my mum. We decided to go into a medium, as you do. Went into the medium and uh, she said to me, oh, your your dad is dead. And I was like, no, he's not. He's down the road. He's probably having a pint. Do you know, like, but mm. she said that to me and I was like, no, no. And she, she went through a few different things and I was like, that's so random. And I'd lost a friend in a car accident earlier that year. But she just said, you need to remember the unconditional love. So this is going, you're going to realise who this is and the message is just unconditional love and you're to remember that and you're to always hold that because while I had an amazing relationship with my dad, we were the exact same. And when I say we butted heads, we could like clash and typical, typical, you know, Mm. family stuff. But anyway, that was the Monday evening. We'd gone out for some food. We came back to the hotel room, watched movies. Just nice evening, just me, my mum and my dad. Tuesday morning. We got up and my mom looked out the window and she said, I really wish we had gone home with everybody else. And I was like, ah, oh, no, don't be like that. Like, you know, like mm. we're going to go up and we're going to go shopping and we're going to do nice things. And that was kind of the start of the day. And she, we said, I said, come on, we go down and get some breakfast. And we said to my dad, are you going to come with us? And he said, no, no, I'm going to wait and we'll go up to Fendial Hall and we get a sandwich. So we went down for a coffee, me and my mom. And we were sitting there and we were looking out the window and it was lashing rain. And mom said, it would nearly remind you at home. And we were chatting about it and she was like, will we get a second cup of coffee? And then it was kind of debate. No, no, we'll go back up to the room. And when we went back up to the room, it was so quiet. And we came in and I was like, 
we must have missed him. He must be gone. And mom said, I'm just going to run in to use the loo. And she went to push the door. But he had collapsed, brushing his teeth behind the door. And I remember going over and reaching, like, putting it all my weight. And I'd lost 10 stone that year. Mm-hmm. And it really stuck with me for a long time because... I, in my mind, I was like, if I had been the bigger Louise, I'd been able to push that door to get into him. But because I was the skinnier Louise, I just couldn't do it. But I stuck my hand in through the door and I touched his neck. And I said to my mom, I think he's dead. And she was like, no, she hit me. She was like, will you give up? Like she was, she was going mad. So I ran over and I, I rang down to reception. And the next thing I know is this huge guy burst into the room. And he, it must have been like two seconds later, got into the bathroom got my dad out and started working on him doing CPR and we were in the hotel room and I can still remember being so we was in Boston it was you could see the whole of um Stewart Street that's another story um but it was the whole you could look right down the street and I could see the ambulance coming the whole way down and I can just remember standing on this balcony going this is not my life isn't this isn't going to happen and like this is going to be okay this is going to be grand and uh, a police officer came in and took my mom and myself outside of the hotel room and he said look we're gonna we're gonna make our way up to the the hospital and you know they're talking you through it and you're kind of thinking this isn't gonna happen this is my like this go and you're kind of making plans like right okay so I might go home on the flight tomorrow night mom will stay with auntie Helen for another few days and you're making these plans and you're like you don't even know what's happening and then you have that I oh, know he'd be grand maybe they'll let him fly anyway and he's getting CPR on the floor like but anyway they eventually um, and I can always remember them doing the, the CPR and everything. Then they'd say stop and they'd wait for the heartbeat. And I can still remember how awful that was. That you're just like, just let something happen. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So that was tough. Yeah. So I can still, and like, that ha- like, and it's weird that that's like a trauma in itself, you know, but... In some of the ways, I don't know anything different, if that makes sense. But I can remember just being like, I can just always remember that silence of just waiting to hear something. And then them going again. And yeah, yeah. So then, um, and I'll always remember the policeman. He was so lovely. So he was just really, he was really like, he was like, you're the Irish family and I'm going to look after you. And he brought us down. And I can remember leaving the hotel and uh, my dad was, brought out they they managed to get like some form of a pulse so that he could be brought to hospital i now know why they were doing that they didn't if he hadn't have um if he hadn't have passed away in hospital there would have been more of an investigation it would have been a lot more trauma on us and in fairness to the firemen and the policemen they did they knew what like it was a, a, a catastrophic event mm-hmm. and they just wanted to get him to the hospital so that he could be pronounced and and make it easier for us Uh, that if it can be easy so we were put into the police car and I can still remember him being put into the ambulance and thinking oh it's grand now like we're on our way but even at that like I can remember getting into the lift and 10 firemen just all standing around you and nobody saying anything and nobody will say anything to you and in your mind you're like god that's weird and we it's shock it's it's that's what it is so we got to the hospital and with that the door opened and this priest arrived in and he was like I was just walking down the street and they asked me, was I with the Irish family? And I said, no, but tell them to bring, like, told them to bring me to you. Like, it was just the most random man. And he came in. No, he was the nice man. He was good. Like, mm-hmm. I personally think he was an angel sent to mm-hmm. mind just because he came in. Um, he said, is there anybody in Ireland? And my mom said, I have one son in Ireland. And he said, he has to be told straight away. And my mom said, oh, nobody knows. Nobody knows. He said, is there anybody in America knows that your husband is after getting sick this morning? And my mom said, oh, yeah, I rang my sister. And he said, I'm telling you now, your son at home knows that your husband is not well. And he's sitting at home not knowing what's going on. So you need to make sure that he's told. So he then frog marched, not frog marched me, but he mm. brought me up to another part of the hospital and had me ring family to get around to be with Aiden and to get him home, to prepare him that there was going to be news. But when I say this man talked us through every step of like, prepare him, tell him something has happened, but don't tell him that like, the worst has happened because we don't know that the worst has happened but he needs to be prepared and you have to remember he's on his own and it was like all the things that he told us to do I know and he was he was amazing but literally I rang my aunt went around and she was amazing she she just went around to the house and she was with Aiden the priest was in the room the doctors came in and he just said 
who are you? And I said, I'm his daughter. And who are you? I'm his wife. And he just shook his head and he said, no, that that's it. Like there was, there was nothing more we could do. And I can remember hearing a scream and I couldn't understand who was screaming. And I can remember looking around thinking like, who's screaming? And then I realized I was screaming. So I was in complete and utter shock. And I thought from that moment, that's how death happened. Mm-hmm. So then you realize as you grow up, life that's not life but that was my first understanding of death my dad was 50 so he was very young but I suppose how old were you 23 and in my mind I remember thinking oh no he'd lived a life oh no he'd lived a life. and I know my brother has said like we've had different conversations at times that like I think to make you cope you tell sorry mm-hmm. I, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. to make mm-hmm. you cope um you tell yourself different things like oh no like he'd, he'd lived a full life or oh no like that's okay like but I think it was just the shock of but also it was really nice like I had a week's holidays with my dad like the night yeah. before he died I was playing pool with him and high-fiving him and you know the crack and the photographs of him and my dad or him and my mom in a restaurant on the Saturday night like and then to be just gone it made you realize how fragile life, fragile life is, that it can literally just be gone in an instant. Mm. But then it made you terrified. And I spent years then, if I rang my mom and she didn't answer the phone, I would be up the walls, driving down the roads to try and find her. Like, And I went into a mode of having to try and fix. So I thought my job was to try and fix my mom mm. and make sure that everything for her was okay. And I didn't really think of myself then. Mm. But I think that's very normal for children to think that they have the, the power and the capability to fix everything that's gone wrong in your parents' life. Mm. And then, as I know, my mom has taken the role of trying to fix everything in my life since I lost Stuart. Can so. I ask you before we continue? Yeah. Um, which is something which is probably hugely important to a lot of people. Um, and it's so funny, right? I don't remember this conversation about your dad. Did you speak I about this? I didn't really talk about it. No, because yeah. I kind of felt like I was going to hog the limelight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't I know really because talk. we had so many in the room yeah. to tell the stories yeah. because, like, I'm completely and utterly shocked like that. Yeah. I, like, I'm, like, still sh- I cut that whole comprehension of stop. Yeah. And you are willing that yeah. person to breed. Yeah. And so show some sign of life. Yeah. Horrific. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Horrific. Absolutely. And then... All of that being done mm-hmm. and the repatriation of your dad. Yeah. And I know it happens and I've, re- but can you talk a bit about that? Do you know what happened there, the process of that? Oh, yeah. So he died in Boston. So it was Thanksgiving week. So in my mind, I, and I like so many things uh, could have been a disaster. Uh, they weren't, I uh, like they weren't, thank God, but it could have been really bad. Um. Like, I remember people saying to us within the first few hours, oh, it's going to take weeks to get him home. And, like, the trauma of people saying that to you, and you, you're literally just trying to get your head around, like, that he's not coming home with you, that you're you're in a foreign country. And even though we were with family, you're still, you're worried at, like, what financial, like, what is this going to do to my family? You're, you're terrified. And, like, you're 23. So all these things are going through your head. Well, this is my experience, obviously. But of course. So, the now I was... I got insurance, we had insurance, thank God, so I got in touch with the insurance company. But basically, we had to pay in full for the everything undertakers-wise from the States. So he also had to come home in like a JFK coffin. It had to be welded shut. It's all of these different things that have to happen. He had to be brought up to New York. So when you die in America, it's something to do with the paperwork. It has to go up to New York to be processed. So I don't know. I, my, I, that was our experience. He died in Boston. Mm. It was Thanksgiving week. He died on the Tuesday and Thanksgiving was the Thursday. And we were just so lucky that when I say, they, they say Irish people are kind. I'm mm. sorry, but the Americans. Mm. I will never forget the kindness and how people went out of their way for my family in such a short amount of time. The, the man, the funeral director, drove my dad. I'm pretty sure it was the day before Thanksgiving 
like literally the next day he got him he got him processed he got everything sorted and he drove him himself up to New York so that he could be on the Saturday flight and he was my dad was at home in our house after Jennings collected him I think he was collected on the Saturday morning and Jennings had him in our house at three o'clock on the Saturday afternoon yeah and it was a gorgeous you know what I have I have to tell this story because it's the funniest story Mm. For us, there's always funny stories about funerals and things like that, but mm. my dad used to love to paint by numbers. Okay. So he'd sit for hours and he'd be doing painting. But when he was being brought back into the house and they were wheeling the coffin into the house, my mom, my brother and myself and my auntie Pat were standing in the hall. And my mom said, oh my God, we're at his paintings. We're looking at his paintings as he's been brought through. And I said, oh, and we were all kind of getting emotional. And my auntie Pat said, Jesus, I never knew he was an artist. I remember I was, I give over, it's fucking paint by numbers. And then we all started to laugh. But I was like, yeah. for me, that's what grief is. It's yeah. your crying one minute, you're breaking your heart, laughing the next. Mm. Because, and that's the way my dad would have liked it in the sense that he would have wanted us to kind of always have that that joke, that kind of, come on, keep yeah. it going. That's the com- camaraderie. Is yeah, that the camaraderie. Right I'm terrible for words, but that's it. Yeah. Can I ask you about your brother? Like, because yeah. obviously oh, yeah. I know you can't speak, speak for him, but just yeah. the trauma for him being at home in that period. Yeah. So do you know what? I'll be honest. We're an Irish family. We haven't ever really had huge conversations mm. about it. And I'm a talker and Aidan is the opposite. He's mm. a bit, but I have to say he's the wise, he's one of the wisest people I know. Mm. He speaks when he needs to speak mm. and he says things and he blows you away with kind of, mm. oh, well, okay, I'm going to listen to you. Yeah. Or I talk so much nonsense. Mm. Nobody listens to any of it. <laughs> so, uh, but I do know that it was, it was very tough on him. So like for him, he was coming home from work. He'd only got a new baby and his partner, they were in the house. They were living with us at the time. They had just moved out from us about a month beforehand. And then they were back in the house minding dogs and stuff mm. when we were away. So they were in the house when my auntie Pat arrived and said something's after happened to your dad. Now, from conversations with Aidan, he says that he knew in his heart and soul something really bad was wrong. And he went out to the conservatory and everybody else is in the house. And he, my mom. So we went back to the hotel and my mom rang Aidan and she just it was because of what the priest said. The priest was like, don't dress it up. Don't flancy it up. Don't don't just say it out. He was like, don't do a big build up. When you talk to him, you have to say, Aiden, your dad is gone. And, you know, talk to him about what happened. And I was in the room, but I wasn't on the phone. Mm. So from my experience, I only have my mom's side of mm. her having to tell Aiden that. And that's awful. awful. And it was horrific for us not to be with Aiden. And mm. I know Aiden is a very protective person. And I think for him, the fact that me and my mom weren't there I think it really like it killed him it kill- I think there might have even been conversations of Aiden thinking he was getting on a flight to come over to literally yeah. fly home with us and um, things like that going on but the other side of it that was horrible was we had to pack up all my dad's things on holidays and we had to bring a bag to the airport and we had to go up to a check-in desk and we had to say to them we're flying home and we've got these extra bags because he's not here he's not coming because when we got to their lingus um fantastic company mm. my god but they were like the only thing you can do is you come and you check in and you get onto the plane and that's you know we'll do our best for you but you know we can't guarantee anything now we were lucky we got on the flight and i think my aunt had rang them and just said look there's two people and they're traveling home for this reason and the pilot put us up into first class and they looked after us and helped us like i, I always remember her just being like drink this lie back go asleep mm. and the next thing was it was we were in Shannon and then Dublin Airport were phenomenal. I, they gave the family a space just just not inside a security, mm. kind of just outside of it. And we walked. I can always remember getting off the plane and people are so respectful. Like it was it was weird as well. You're on the flight and everybody knew that mm. there'd been a, a problem and like that they were going to wait back and let us have two minutes to kind of get ahead of everybody to get out mm. of the airport. And then when we got up to the the belt, my brother was there. He was allowed to come in to, to oh, be with God. us. Yeah, And that was like, it's horrible to even be like in Dublin airport. Mm. But look, what can you do? And was your dad in the same flight as us? No, no, no. So we came home Wednesday into Thursday. Mm. Um, so we had Thursday and Friday to prepare of the fact. Mm. But my mom's family were phenomenal. They're... My mom has her like my mom has her own. Her dad died when she was eleven, and her her mom passed away by the time she was eighteen. So she has her, you know, mm. she's her family are very 
close. Mm. I think it's the only way, like, but they just rallied and they were there. And my dad's family are fantastic as well. But they were dealing with like their their oldest mm. brother at 50. Mm. My nanny was still alive and God. her eldest boy like was gone and just so rapidly quick. So it was a very, it was a very, it was a traumatic time, but it was a beautiful funeral. And it was exactly how he would have wanted it. Yeah. Isn't it mad about the medium? That always, like, and the fact that the, d- the different messages that she said to me, mm. it was, it's always, it's always played on my mind. Does it? Like, yeah. it was the last thing I said going into the room. So we were walking back into the hotel room and I said to my mum, I wonder who it is that died that has a message for me. And then, yeah. Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. Yeah. And then we talked about the, um, the connection of Stuart Street. Yeah. So talk to me about Stuart. So I have to tell you about the Stuart Street thing, right? Yeah. So I didn't meet Stuart until two years after my dad had died. And our number was 28. So we met the 28th of February 2008. And 28 was like in everything in our lives. But when we went back to Boston, we were standing. And I knew it was Stuart Street and it's mm. S-T-U-A-R-T. And, mm. you know, that was how he spelled his name anyway. But when we went back to Boston and we were, st- he came with me 10 years later because I hadn't been able to go back. Mm. And uh, we went down and we were on Stuart Street, but outside of the hotel, it says 28 North. And I was like, that's where my dad was wheeled out. And I was like, how random. But anyway, like, I'm weird like that. About no, but I think like so many people are. And I think yeah. it's life. Like, and this is the reason that I do the podcast. And um, I talked, I, I, I'll talk about this on my own stories, but like I, I was asked to go take part of a thesis and the guy was like, why did you do And I was like, it's just because life is so random, but it's not. I was yeah. like, and there's so many connections. Like we are all wired. Like we mm. are all wired. Yes. Um, so the stories, the fact that Stuart, number 28 and yeah. so on, and the medium, your dad, everything yeah. is just so mad. Yeah. Yeah. So it is. But that to me, it's very special that because it's kind of, it is all the things are, intertwined but I kind of felt it was another little nod that my dad was like I got you a good one mm, <laughs> and mm, he did he mm. got me a good one so where just me Facebook and he wasn't allowed to tell anybody for about two years I was like you tell anyone because it was wasn't a thing it was like I was like listen yeah I didn't meet anybody on Facebook I was I was snatched at the pub no I wasn't <laughs> yeah. it was on Facebook and we met and we just became the best of friends like from the get-go and he was the most romantic man that's why I like he wrote me a book for my birth, the very first birthday that I was going out with him. And he took photographs of everywhere we went on dates. And like, he wrote down like all the different, like how I was 52 days old then. And but like how his life changed from the day he met me and all these things. They were, and then after my birthday, we used to like, whenever we'd go on a trip, we'd sit and we'd write stuff. Now, can I just say, yeah, that would give me the ick if anybody else did that. Did that. But I don't know when he did things, I was just like, oh, that's yeah. so cute. Like, yeah. But I won't lie, like, somebody else could do that. And I'd be like, ew. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. But he was, he was just, he was so, he would think of the most thoughtful gifts. Random stuff. But he was a fabulous, fabulous, uh, he was a fabulous boyfriend. Uh, don't get me wrong, he wasn't perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, but he was, he was his own special, own special kind of guy. But uh, we were together 11 months mm. and we had been away. And you know, as you're messing, you're trick acting. Mm. I pinched his arm just on the inside. Well, the bruise that came up, you'd swear I'd bet him stupid. And I was like, God, oh, that's, that's not good. So he showed his mom and she was like, no, I don't like the look of that. You need to go and get bloods done. So then that December, they kind of thought that maybe it was like a, a myelodysplasic syndrome, which is a form of leukemia. It was definitely showing up in his bone marrow. So started testing things like that. But it was all like, no, this is just something that could happen. But mm. go to London. They'll continue to monitor you. Uh, this was 2000 and What does go to London 10. mean? Uh, go to London, it was because in King's College Hospital in London, they're the specialists of MDS, mm. which is this type of bone marrow issue. It tends to happen in men from 50, 60 years of age onwards. It's a very rare type of... Uh, leukemia now I'm going to say it wrong so I like this is my understanding of it and I just mm. want to say that my only experience is through Stuart so mm. um but basically it was it's a blood disorder and it's a form of cancer but when they found it in Stuart it was like as if it was pre-cells 
So they were like, will you go to London and let them have a look and test and see what's going on? Because they kind of thought, well, maybe if they found it early enough, they'd learn stuff about it. And Stuart, in fairness, was always very much like, oh, yeah, if I can learn about my body and I get to I get the best medical care. Absolutely. So that started our relationship with King's College Hospital in the UK. And this is 11 months into your relationship? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Yeah. How long after your dad? Um, two, no, that'd be coming up on five years. Okay. No, we met, my dad died in 2005, December, like November, just mm. heading into December, and I met Stuart in 2008. So two years later, so you're talking just coming up on three, yeah. three and a half years, yeah. And then so. this happened. So he went to, the, you pinched him, he went to the doctor, the doctor said, you need to go and do this. And then they looked at it and said, we think it's this, but you need to go yeah. to London. He to was, do. he was blessed. He, Stuart was always blessed with the doctors that he fell upon. Mm. So like he ended up in Blanchestown Hospital with a doctor who had trained in King's College Hospital and had come across this before. So put him into contact with this amazing Dr. Mufti and I think it's Mufti in the UK and he that's so then he looked after Stuart's care and he was amazing he was the most amazing man and Stuart would go over three and four times a year you're talking every three months you would be over and back to London and what do you do think while all this was going on like what are you thinking what's he thinking um so the so when that happened with that that started in the November Stuart broke up with me on the Christmas Eve <sighs> Uh, and I, I like I Tell have to me. say we never had a Christmas Eve again afterwards where I'd be like oh look Stuart it's around now you were breaking up and he'd be like just let it go like, no you ruined it <laughs> it was our first Christmas and you ruined it but yeah. he struggled he struggled an awful lot with it and he struggled with the fact that he had been single and kind of his own man until he was 25 and then he meets someone and we're madly in love and we're delighted with life and then this happens and then he felt well if I'm really sick I don't want to have to leave somebody I don't want to have to leave somebody behind and I I don't want to have to do that to somebody else. And then my stance on it was, you're going to ruin your own life, Grant. You're not ruining mine. So I was the stubborn pig being like, no, no, no. I'll just, you do whatever you need to do. But I'm like, I'm I'm, here. I'm not going anywhere. So I'm here. Don't get me wrong. It was tough. Do you think there's a lot of people in like that do that? A lot of people who get sick and think, you know, I have to do this on my own because I can't break her heart or his heart or anything like that and I think it's I can't carry your emotions with mine mine are mm. tough enough and of course mm. of course like to have to look at somebody else suffering because you're suffering and you're you're kind of like I think there's like a selfish part but like oh, you I'm the one in the pain I'm the one getting mm. poked and prodded and you're crying because you're standing on the sideline so it must be very hard for the person but at the same time um, I tried to balance that at the time. I tried to, I tried very hard to kind of be like, and I think I struggled as well with our relationship then being like, did I force you to be in the relationship with me? And it took, it like, it, it was, it was tough. Like, we like, but I think it made us so much stronger as the years went on and mm. we were just cemented together. Can you talk to me just a little bit? Because I just yeah. wanted to delve into that whole thing about, you force them and you thinking that you thinking oh. that and then him you know because I, I did what was it what was it? it was some program I was watching it's probably it's like program I don't know it could be sex or it could be not it's not sexy but you know what I mean oh it was sex in the sea okay. where Steve had the cancer Miranda stayed and, and you know like stayed because of the cancer and then he yeah. wanted to break away because he you know he was cancer free and then did want to like is it is that a mind fuck um <sighs> No, no, because I never. I was always just like, "I love you." Mm. That's it. Mm. But I won't lie. After Stuart died, I have had moments where I thought, "Like, what would my life be had I been like, okay, bye?" And God, like, and I, I, you'd be lying. Mm. You'd be lying to everyone if you said no. That didn't cross my mind. Like, mm. I like. My whole thing as a child was I was going to be a mammy. Like, mm. my, what was the one thing I was going to do in my life? I was going to be a mammy. I was going to pop out these kids and I was going to be Mother Earth. And through everything, that didn't happen. But I was very conscious in the, that's what I want. Mm. I wanted Stuart. And I don't know. I don't know. It's like, you know, the way you, like I look at things in a, that's where I was supposed to be. Mm. Couldn't imagine my life really being any other way mm. than being by Stuart's side through that. And I learned so much. And I grew so much as a person that I'm completely different. And I'm so grateful 
to mm. like to be honest it's just it wasn't a sacrifice yeah. but at the same time I do wonder like mm. you'd be, like when the pain was really bad just after like just after Stuart died and you're absolutely in the like the worst like depths of I can't like you can't actually physically describe what goes on in your body and how your whole body aches and you just in that moment yeah I, I probably would have been like yeah no I'd taken the easy road and it probably mm. would have been in, like in mm. my mind it was the easy road because if I hadn't if I had never met him that's the thing but then mm. I think no matter what like it was always going to really hurt like that yeah because I'd met him and I knew him and like it broke my heart that Christmas Eve when he said to me like mm. oh no I don't know I can't do this how long did you break up for oh like about two hours Oh, but like, do you sake. know what I mean? Like, but when I said, <laughs> "Tears me, taking you broke up for six months," and no, you're like, no, back no. At I will say, like, yeah. and you threw that back at his face every year. Yeah. Oh God, I was good like that. No, no, no. Can I just like, we had that type of banter, the two of mm. us. But what, like, we we didn't ever break up. That it was we're not together. Yeah. But it was a road to get back together, mm. in the sense that he didn't want to be with anybody else. I didn't want to be with anybody else. But it was very much a lot of patience of, okay, you don't want to talk to me on the phone for two days. That's fine. We didn't live together. It it was a lot of what you need, go with. Mm. And that was the wrong thing to do on my part. Mm. Because I sacrificed wholly myself. Everything was about his needs. Mm. And then come down the road three years, then you had to retrain that. You had Mm. to go like, no, actually, that's not life. The world doesn't revolve around you. Mm. You don't get to just to turn. Like, but that's, I think that's life, isn't it? Yeah. I think that is relationships. And it's my experience, but that's pretty much what happened. It was like, mm. I gave so much of like, right, okay, you just, whatever you need to do, however selfish you need to be, you be that. And I'm going to take it. And then we went to New York. We went to New York on our holidays. Mm. And I can't, like, I wanted to, he kept talking about walking the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, we're going to walk the Brooklyn Bridge together. And it's going to be the most amazing thing. Mm. And we got to the Brooklyn Bridge and he's like, right, come here. I've done this six times. You go on and walk across the bridge there. And I, I'm just going to be here waiting on you. And I was like, what? And he was like, and I've done it loads of times. And I'm just, I'm not arsed today. So you just go on and I'll, I'll wait here for you. And I was devastated. Now this was, so you're talking like, we're talking a good 11 months after the yeah. break up and then we're back together. Like mm. we weren't ever broken up. But yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to be like, it was a real turmoil that yeah, year. Yeah. 2009. And <laughs> I hold on to things. Yeah. Um, but we went out that night yeah. and I sat him down in the, the restaurant and I said, okay, so we've come on the holiday and we're in a relationship, but you win, you're going home single. You're going home. You, you win. I give up, I can't do it. I've tried everything, I've tried it. And he was like, what? And I was like, no, no, you win, you're single. Yeah. And we can still be friends and all of that, but I can't do this anymore, I can't. That was that then. He was like, no, it's not what I want. Like, And he was, and he just realised in that moment how selfish she was being. Yeah. And then the next day we, we marched the Brooklyn Bridge yeah. together. Because well, you were like, I've been there for you the whole time and you just no. wouldn't walk a bridge with me. <laughs> it wasn't, I was just like, no. I, I was just like, no. You win, you win. Like, I can't do this. I can't, I've given so, and I just, I was just like, no, I'm not going to be treated like shit. And I think at one point he'd walked in front, like he, like he didn't treat me like shit, but he just wasn't being very good. He was being very selfish. And I think when you're very sick, there is a selfish, selfishness that can happen. But I think you have to have someone strong that stands up and says, come here now. Yeah. I get what's going on, but you don't get to be selfish and you don't get to treat everybody like crap. Yeah. And it was just, and after that then, when I say to you, the chap was a new man. And it wasn't, I think he just realised, he was like, no, if I want this to work. Yeah, yeah. And he did want it to work. Yeah. So, and like, we went out at the best. Can I tell you a funny story? Yeah. I love telling funny stories yeah. about Stuart because like we did, we, we, the one thing we always did was we laughed. Mm. But we went down into the subway afterwards and like, so we, we, we sat on TikTok and we yeah. TikTok the relationship over yeah. and it was Grant. And 
we would like I think we were there about three hours and I think your man the poor waiter was like eh, can I yeah. get something else yeah yeah <laughs> it's together to or not? yeah 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 <laughs> but we went down into the subway to go back mm. to the hotel and this poor homeless lady comes up to Stuart and like starts flashing him and starts singing if you want it you've got it forever and I said there you are now you're sorted you're sorted and he was like don't <laughs> but, I was like, but I was like oh I'm delighted now you're yeah, absolutely you like, yeah, 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 that yeah. was our relationship we yeah. joke and we laugh and everything was grand but yeah. when we came back from the holiday it was the holiday that made us yeah but there was a huge part of the holiday that thought it broke us. Do you get me? Yeah, one hundred percent. It made us. Yeah, and tell me, you just said then I interrupted you rudely about your King's Cross. So tell me about that. So Stuart, uh, he would go back and forth to King's Cross, and he was getting blood tests. So uh, in the summer of two thousand and ten, Stuart was big into weightlifting. For not like super physique, looked after himself. The chap watched everything nutrition wise that went into his body never really drank until he was 25 um just didn't want to then he would he'd kind of have the odd drink but he was never a big drinker Mm. nothing like that and his birthday that year we had stayed in a hotel we'd gone away and then he was getting this weightlifting machine delivered Mm. so we came back to the the house and we're waiting on it and he was lying in bed shivering and shaking flu like symptoms and i was like it's really weird like and it's his birthday he's not really in good form Mm. and his weightlifting machine is coming Anyway, he had cellulitis. So it's a form of like a, I'm going to say it's like an infection in your blood. Mm. It's a very common thing. But Stuart went into A&E that night and he didn't come home till the 5th of October then. I think it was around the 5th of October. It could have even been later that month. Um, His liver failed. So he got, he had cellulitis and then by the August bank holiday weekend, so his birthday's the middle of July, Mm. Uh, by the August Bank holiday weekend, his liver had failed and he was being transported over to Vincent's Hospital to the liver transplant unit. It was was this because of the cellulitis? Yeah, it's, it just the infection just kept going, kept going. It was like he had a weaker immune system because of this blood dis- disorder mm. um, and it just took hold and he just kept getting sicker and sicker and he had his liver failed. He went like Bart Simpson in the bed. He literally went to luminous. And every day you were going over to the hospital and you were like, today's the day he's going to be a bit better. And every day he'd go over, he was just sicker and sicker. Um, and then they transferred him over to Vincent's. And that was that was the first time that I ever heard the words that like he'd be lucky to make it through the night. And I was like, what? Um, and his mom, his dad and myself were there. And he was in the high, high dependency unit and he was put on to CPAP, a breathing machine, everything to try and help his body. And he was very sick for... He was very sick for a good month in Vincent's hospital, but they were miracle workers and they turned it around and the liver rejuvenates itself. So he was very lucky that it did. He was put onto a certain type of medication. And because King College, King's College were already looking after if he was going to have a bone marrow transplant mm. and there was already bone marrow there and everything ready to go um, from a family member that if he needed a transplant, that was all going to happen in London. And that was all a question mark. So... Mm the liver failed they were like well, we're going to have to refer you to the liver transplant unit in uh, king's college as well because it's usual that if you have a bone marrow transplant and you need an organ transplant they'll tend to do the two at once because you have to shut the whole immune system down and okay. all of these things it was always so complicated like, i mean i like and it's going to get more complicated mm-hmm. so i'll try and tell the really short story because you'll be like oh my god we'll come back next week <laughs> 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 um so he was over and he was over and back then to King's College because of his liver failure. Because in Dublin, the professor said, "I don't know why he got so sick, but even more so, I don't know how he got better. He got better, and we can't tell you why or how he got better. He got himself better, but I will say, like his mom was phenomenal in knowing about how to like make up food plans for him, mm. Reg- like putting in the diary, eat at this time, do this. If we're not here, you're going like." Phenomenal, mm. phenomenal. And Stuart, because of his weightlifting from such a young age, he was used to that kind mm. of um, is it regime or yeah, like, yeah. I wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. But because of that, he got himself better. He did. Like he he absolutely did. Um so that started the road then of over and back to King's College because of liver and he'd be over to Vincent's and then it was the two clinics in the UK and he'd try and line it up that he'd be into the bone marrow clinic and he'd be going to the liver clinic over in the UK. That was fine and life got back on to normal. Like when I say that was 2011 
or 2010, 2011, we moved into the house together. We got our lives together. We were just flying it. 2013, got engaged. 2014, we were getting married and it was the absolute, like, and I have to say, for a fella who never thought he was going to get married, he had serious opinions of how the <laughs> wedding was going to go. I was like, no, no, no. Mm. But we, like, so, and in that year that we were getting married, he got chicken pox and then he got shingles and then he got chicken pox and then he got shingles and then he got chicken. And it was this, it was like a back and forth. It was like, and I was kind of thinking, is he going to have chicken pox the day of the wedding? Yeah. He couldn't shift it. Now look on back. It was his liver was starting to slowly be under so much pressure. It was already so badly damaged and had come back. But it was starting to, to cave, as they'd say. Um, and then the, the shingles and the chicken pox didn't help. So we were on holidays, we were on honeymoon. And we were walking up hills and he couldn't really breathe properly. And his legs were huge, they were swollen. We couldn't really understand it, but we just saw heat. And we, we used to love walking all over the place. And it was there's a lot of hills in Malta. So we just, we made, like, we'd rationale everything away. Yeah. There was nothing. Anyway, and Stuart was covered in tattoos and was never told, don't get a tattoo. Yeah. Never told, you know, mm. you should never get them again. So that was 2014, late 2014. Everything was fine. We were still kind of ticking away. Life was fine. Trying for babies. We thought that was going to happen. September 2015, we started going to the Harry Clinic uh, in the Rotunda to try and see IVF wise. Could we go down that road? And when the doctor done blood tests in the Rotunda, she was saying, are you sure there's nothing else going on with your bloods? And the doctors haven't talked to you about this. And they haven't said anything. And Stuart was like, no, no. It's like, I have all of these issues. They've always been there. And they were like, all oh, right, no, it's just the bloods are just way off. And like, that could be like, like I have my own issues. There was just, there was multiple mm. different issues, but they were like, are you sure you're, because they were doing so many bloods. And so it was like, I get my bloods done in the two different hospitals each month. No, 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 everything's fine. So that was the September. So there was a little bit of awareness. And then in the October, Stuart went over for a routine checkup in London. And they were like, oh, you have to stay. Your hemoglobin has dropped like six. So your your blood levels should never be six. So severely anemic. And they were going to have to do like scopes and to do gave and different things like that. Uh, to, it's like a webbing to try and stop if you're losing blood through your stomach. Because they were thinking like so much medication going in for your liver. All of these different things. Now we realise. Like now afterwards you look back and you go, no, it's all just little signs that different things were going. But there was nobody joining all the dots together at the time. So that was the end of October. I get a phone call and work. Uh, I have to stay in London. There's a problem. And I was like, okay, you need to come over on the flight tomorrow night and bring me home, but you'll have to discharge me. Mam's going to, like, we used to take turns going over and back. So that was grand. I went over to London with one little suitcase because I was coming home in the morning and I was there for two and a half weeks. And they starved him. They were going to do the scope. No, they didn't do the scope. And it was every day he was being starved to go down to the scope. And he'd get to eat for an hour or two and then it'd be no fast again for tomorrow. And the chap went from being this solid guy down to nothing. Never ended up getting the scope. We ended up coming home and we, we like after two and a half weeks, it was just like, it cost us thousands, thousands waste. Like, I don't like, but like, you're not giving out about it. But at the same time, it was just frustration. Mm. And anyway, he, we came home and it was okay. You're going to get yourself better. We're going to have the scope here. You're going to, everything's going to be fine. But Stuart had a tattoo booked in Portugal for the top of his leg. Okay. And I said to him, please don't. And his mom didn't want him to go either. And I didn't want him to go. But I never told Stuart not to do something because I was like, no, you know, he's, I suppose I always trusted his judgment. But I didn't realize that he always had the, that he also had a reckless, side. like not a reckless, he wasn't reckless. Mm. But in hindsight, he did look back on it and say, I think it was part of me. It was like, I knew I was getting sick. And it was like, I'll get me fucking tattoo. Mm, like, mm, you know, because that mm. was his, he loved his tattoos. Anyway, he went to Portugal with his brother. And he knew I wasn't too happy about the fact that he was going to Portugal. So when he came home from Portugal and he was ignoring me, and he was kind of hiding out in the room, bedroom, he was like, I think I got a flu on the plane. I think I got a cold. Wasn't feeling great. And I was like, 
okay that's not like him I was like he's really avoiding me I'd come home in the evenings and I'd be gone to bed and I was kind of I was on a huff thinking mm. is he huffing at me He, you know he's the one that went to Portugal yeah exactly and I was like like I don't even care that he went to Portugal blah, but he, he had the flu so I went to my work Christmas party and I got a text message off his mum saying I don't think Stuart's too well can you come home and this was first thing on the Saturday morning I was like yeah yeah no problem so I came home and when I came into the house Stuart was I like I can't like I can't even describe how sick he was but I was just like it was the shock that I got it was a little bit like the cellulitis time it was like uh how are you so like how is he after getting so sick but we knew we'd have to put him into the car to get him to Vincent's because where we lived was in Old Town County Dublin and no ambulance will take you from Old Town over to Vincent's and there was no point in going through via Blanchardstown because it would take weeks to get from Blanchardstown to Vincent's with referrals Mm. and all sorts of I swear to God, it's a disaster sometimes. Um, this is all very... I know, like, it's uh, like it's very hard to tell Stuart's story in a mm, small course, block. Yeah. Anyway, we... It took us about 12 hours to talk Stuart out of the house because he wasn't going anywhere. He wasn't budging. He wasn't anything. And then I ended up... I came up the stairs because I just... I broke and I started packing a bag. And he said, what are you doing? I said, you're going into the hospital and that's it. And he was like, right, okay, I'm going to start moving. There was floods, there was all sorts on the road. There were storms, it was a disaster. But anyway, his dad and myself got him out of the house, got him down to the car and we got him across to Vincent's Hospital. And when we went into Vincent's Hospital, he'd only had a procedure and we knew his blood levels had gone back up to 11. Mm. And they brought him into resus. And I remember the doc- I remember being left out. You know the way they leave you outside? Mm. And with that, this doctor, uh, and his name was Paul, and he came running out and he was like, get in here, get in here. My dad's name is Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was like, get in here. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, his hemoglobin is four. When was his last? And I was like, and I remember standing there going, how am I going to tell his mother? This is what I was going on. I was like, because yeah. I was like, like, she know, like, she'd know all of these different things. And I was like, how do you ring somebody and say his hemoglobin is four? Mm. So there was a mad dash to get blood into him. And he called me aside and he was like, he has sepsis. He has a matter of hours to turn this around. That was like it was just and I was I remember being just traumatized that this was happening. But he was extremely sick and he was in hospital. Basically, he got pseudomonas, which is a type of infection in the tattoo. But it was his immune system was so low, couldn't cope with it. But the whole tattoo fell away. So he had an open wound from his knee to his hip. Pretty much the whole thigh. thigh yeah. So um, that was one factor. There was talk about plastic surgeries, all sorts of different things. And then once again, Stuart started to bounce back. And it was, he was going to, this was the start of December. He was home and all for Christmas, dressing wounds and things like that. I was doing all that. And he was on a bit of oxygen because when he'd be in pain, we always thought when he was in pain, he was holding his breath. But we then found out later on a couple of years down the road that that wasn't the case. He was exhausted. Oh, Rebecca, I won't lie to you. I can remember peeling potatoes on Christmas Day because all I wanted to do was give him a Christmas dinner. Yeah, do you know, like, just, mm. I just wanted everything to be normal. Normal and Adele's album, you know, when we were young. Mm. And I fucking cried and cried and cried peeling those potatoes because I was on my own with Stuart down in that house. Um, and where we lived was very remote. Uh we were there on our own that Christmas and I was dressing a wound on a leg. I was making sure that oxygen was okay. I was making dinners was cooked, all of these things. I then had to fight with the chemist on Stevens's day to get this really expensive cream that he needed. To, it was like a silver based cream. I can't, like it was, and I can remember just begging the chemist in the caves and swords. And she was so lovely. She was like, look, she was like, only because you're in a state. But in my mind, I was like, I have to get home to this person that's like so sick. But yeah, I was exhausted. Yeah. And that was the start of it. And I think I knew. And that day, peeling the potatoes, I knew my whole life had changed. I knew my whole life was, that it was never going, I don't know how to even describe it, but I just knew it was never going to be the same again. I don't, and like Stuart and I loved our traveling, I'd go out for dinners and I always, I could accept, yeah, you aren't going to have babies. That's no problem. We, we Could we, you we, accept that? I did. I got to the point where I accepted it. But in my mind, I was accepting it because it's okay. I have Stuart. It's okay. I have Stuart. Like, and we had Bruce. We got Bruce the dog. 
um, after our honeymoon. And uh, I used to be like, oh, maybe he's the, like, and in fairness, the dog is like, he's still, he's still rocking it out there in the gaff. Mm. Um, but it was, don't get me wrong, it wasn't in any way an easy thing to take. Like it took the guts of two years of, and I, st- I still to this day would have times where you'd be like, I wish that I did get to do that, but I accept that I didn't. I accept it. And to be honest with you, I wouldn't change it. If you were to say to me, you could have two children, not have Stuart and not have had that experience and not be who you are today, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it. Good for you. Because it's just I accept. I accept everything. Doesn't mean I like it, but I accept it. But no, the children was a huge thing. And Okay. This is where the tears are put. Um, Stuart wrote me, he had a journal. And he used to, he'd write messages to me when he knew he, like, he, I, he never really gave up. But he'd write me little notes and he put in the journal one day how one of the hardest things was that he never got to have children. And he never got to have children with me and that we didn't get to have that. And he, he felt awful guilt I think he thought that he had to own that, but he didn't. It was the two of us were in that boat. Do you know what I mean? And there was no guarantee had I not been with Stuart that I was going to have children because I have PCOS. I have other issues going on. So I never was like, well, because you're sick, that's it. No, I could have been with the healthiest man and that wouldn't have ha- may not have happened. But hey, I wasn't supposed to go that road. This is the road that I, I came down and I wouldn't change it. Wouldn't change it for anything. What else would he put in the notes for you? That man put in the notes uh, how to go for the widow's pension, how to who to ring in his job if I had a problem. Uh, he worked for the civil service, so there was a survivor's contribution of it. He put contact names in there. He literally wrote step by step everything that was to happen. And he did that in about six weeks before he died. He worked a month the week before he died. He was on 100% oxygen. He was on dialysis. He was waiting on a double lung transplant. And he was still working full time. Like he had his, he had his liver transplant. Like the man was amazing. And he taught you how to live. And I don't mean like live in like having finances and rich things. And he taught me how to live in the moment. Now don't get me wrong, I'm still contrary. And I still give out. But... He would get up every morning, he'd make a cup of coffee and he would make it like, this is how it's going to be. And he'd make sure he had a nice coffee and it would be done in a lovely mug. And he had it every single way and he'd cherish that sip of coffee because that was life. That was, and other people grab a coffee and they fucking knock it back and they run this and they're this and they're that. And they run past their loved ones. Stuart never did any of that. He savoured every moment he got on this earth. So he made every moment of his 37 years absolutely made every moment of it yeah he was phenomenal and that's why i love talking about it because talking to you there's people out there learning about Stuart, and it keeps him alive and i know when the night audrey and you know she was like rebecca you have no idea what he was like oh yeah he was amazing. no idea what he was like yeah. yeah he was deadly he was deadly like he was deadly. Like, he was just... He was so kind. He Like, he didn't suffer Egypts. He didn't, like... If he didn't like it, it wasn't that he was rude. He would never... But if he... If he, if you were in that... If you were in... You, there was... You were, like... I, I can't describe it, but... He was such a special... I'm probably not doing him any justice now. Yeah. Um, but... You could sit with Stuart and he would have time for you. Not many people have time for you to sit. And what I loved was my mom. I used to beg him. So Stuart used to love lying in bed till three and four o'clock as well before he got sick. Yeah. Um, and then he was in hospital for nine months and he never lay in bed again. He was up at half five every single morning. And I used to always be like, will you please come for a coffee with me and my mom on a Saturday? Because that's our little thing mm. that we do. And when he got sick and he came out of hospital, 99% of Saturdays, he was down the road. Uh, to have coffee with me and my mum and it was one of his favourite things to do and 
I went to America on a holiday and he'd ring my mum and be like, are we going to this garden centre? Are we going to this? Are we going to... Like, he just... He... He... Appreciated it. He appreciated everything so much more. But it wasn't the big stuff. It was the people. And it was having time with people. And even his own family... He adored his family. He adored them so much. And he was all about family. That was what mattered. Fuck everything else. How did he die? So Stuart had his liver transplant. And it he got really, really sick that year. And I must have been told about four or five times. Stuart's going to pass away. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. He ended up in ICU for weeks on 24-hour dialysis. Um. I used to stuff custard into him because that was no salt. Like we had all these different things and he used to say that's the real C word. But like these are like these are all little Stuartisms. But he had his liver transplant. And after that moment, then he was on oxygen and they kept thinking, no, it's just because of the damage that was done waiting on the liver because he had to wait that long. Um, But he never managed to get off oxygen. And then they found that he had um, it's called pulmonary hypertension. So it's where the gas is exchanging in the lungs don't do it properly um there's like a delay so if he was sitting here mm. he would have been able to have a conversation with you wouldn't even have been breathless but if you went to stand up all the oxygen it, it didn't travel around his okay. body the way it should um so he had a couple of different issues in that sense but he was always on oxygen and then he'd get an infection and he'd need more oxygen and then he'd be grand and then he'd get another infection and he'd need more oxygen but, like, he used to go out power walking with his oxygen tank on his back over to Malahide Castle. And he then, when he couldn't have enough oxygen on his backpack, he got himself, you know, the little granny trolleys? Yeah. He was like, they're fucking good. He'd bring yeah. tanks and yeah. tanks yeah. of oxygen. He'd be like, I'm going, see you. Yeah. He just, he made sure he was living his life. He just, he was like, how do I make this work? How do mm. I make that work? Everything was about, yeah, okay. And th- I think that's also why not getting to have children. Okay, right not nice it's not the way I want it to be sit with it how can I make how can I make my life work for me he was very much like okay I don't want to be on oxygen I want to be able to weight lift but hey what's the next best thing I can go for a walk get out and I can take oxygen in I could be sitting in the hospital I could be sick do you get me yeah but his like I used to carry oxygen canisters into the matter hospital when he was transferred to the matter because of his lungs and I'd be getting the bus from Finglas into the Matter Hospital with six canisters of oxygen so he could walk the hospital and get himself coffees while he was in getting tests because he couldn't be stuck to the ward because yeah. he'd be demented. Mm. But I had no problem. I'd be on buses with oxygen tanks now. And people would be like, are you mad? And I'd be like, I don't get- If he's happy, yeah. if, if I can bring his oxygen tank to him and let him have that, why wouldn't I? Mm. Why wouldn't I? Like, and I don't, th- I don't think there's anybody that would disagree with me. They'd yeah. be like, fuck it. So what? It's 10 minutes out of my day. Mm-hmm. But I used to bring him his coffee and his croissant at seven o'clock in the morning. Yeah, <laughs> I was that good a wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very proud to be that yeah, good of a wife. Like, yeah. I loved being his mm-hmm. wife. I loved that. Um, but he slowly got sicker. And after his liver transplant, it was constantly working towards medication to help him get better. And then we realised... He wasn't going to get better. And they said, no, you're going to need a double lung transplant. So let's start working you up towards that. Um, they started working him up towards the double lung transplant and then his kidneys failed. So he ended up on dialysis. So that was a real kick. That really, and it made him very sick. That's when Stuart became sick in my eyes. At the same time, I'm fairly sure I had a nervous breakdown. The way my nervous breakdown occurred was I herniated a disc in my back and I couldn't walk. But when I say I couldn't walk, I literally lay on a floor for three months and I couldn't move. I couldn't look after Stuart. I couldn't. I didn't want to live. I have been in the place where, (coughs) sorry, I didn't want to live. And it's very hard to say that to people. um, But I'm very honest about it that I remember being put into a wheelchair to be brought out of the house to get over to Beaumont because I couldn't physically I couldn't do, like, I couldn't even get up to go to the toilet. Like, I couldn't move. And I was like, but I was so determined that I needed to get to the hospital to get these painkillers. And I needed surgery um, on my spine. That I was, I remember being in the wheelchair at the front door. And like, it's a horrible moment, but it's a truthful moment that my mom, 
I was screaming in pain and my mom was like what can I do for you what can I do for you and I was honest and I said get me a gun because I want to fucking kill myself and that might be very hard for people to but to hear that but when I said I don't say it lightly like I meant every word of it I was in chronic pain and I was watching my husband die so I just felt that the world was coming at me every single way that like I my husband was dying I was in chronic pain. I couldn't look after him. I couldn't look after myself. And it was just, that was my, that, that was my lowest point. That was my lowest point. And Stuart went ballistic at me. And my sister-in-law and my mom just stood by crying because they were like, what do you do in this? And it, like, I, do I regret it? Absolutely. That I felt like that in front of Stuart. And he was, he absolutely annihilated me saying, I'm fighting that for every breath that I have. And you're saying that in front of me. And I, of course, my reaction was, this isn't about you. But it was. Mm. like. Mm. But I'm very honest in, in my life. Like, I'd be, mm. I can't sit here and go, and we always smiled at each other. And we were like, no, we were real people. And it got really fucking hard. So hard. So hard. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, what Stuart went through. And I wouldn't wish it on anybody to have to go through that. But I know there's people out there tonight. And it kills me that this people out there tonight going through similar and it's how you feel or you're not supported there's no support in this country I was told like I wasn't a real carer because I managed to keep a full-time job and the only reason I got to keep a full-time job was I had the most understanding employers that were just like we know that you need to have a job to feel normal so you can we will make it work we will make it work for you and yeah, it's Incredible. it was the most horrendous time, and I don't know whether it did. Ma- it did make me stronger. It did make me. It did make me stronger, but and it didn't make me bitter. I'm very glad that it didn't make me bitter. Mm. But I don't know if I'm just walking around in a haze still. And I do ask that question all the time. I I constantly go, "Am I going to wake up in ten years, and it's all going to hit me?" I hope not. I hope that as I feel I'm doing process it and I'm going through it and I talk about it I talk I think I think that's why I talk so much about it because I feel like I'm no I'm processing it and that's Mm. it I don't hold things in I I talk and I process Mm. but who knows Mm. in 10 years time maybe I hope not Mm. but nobody can get like this like I'll get to the group later but there's Mm. people that come through the door that are 20 years down the road and they say things and it's like okay that can still happen after 20 years. I thought I was through that stage, you know? Mm. But that's the good thing about having a group. You realize. Tell me about it. So. We have spoke about it, but yeah. just tell me it a bit, like. Yeah, so after losing Stuart, um, I, it was during COVID. So there was no physical, there was no, there was no people around. There was nothing. Um, and I would have loved to have had, a group that I could go to to just sit and be and ask questions and all the paperwork and all the crap that you have to do and just actually I craved looking at somebody to go uh you know what this feels like you you're 37 you've no kids because everybody seemed to have kids I know that that sounds so like why are you focused on that but for me nobody seemed to be my age married after having such a long illness no children where do you go how, like, I didn't even know how to rebuild my life because I had no life. My whole life was hospitals. For five years, my life was hospital appointments, looking after Stuart, work. Uh, uh, uh. Like, that's all it was. So I couldn't tell you what I liked to do, not like to do. And then it was COVID. So I was just driven demented. Was it a COVID funeral? Yeah, six people. Well, ten people. But really it was, yeah, there was eight because you have the person that's, doing the funeral and then there was the person video so his two nephews had to wait outside that's one of my regrets I wish I had said to your man tell you what then you you like, because yeah. he was you know but you you do that now you say that now that like I should have told him to mm. piss off me run the funeral ourselves but you can't do that either but I just thought how lousy like to like it wasn't like we were arriving like 60 people mm. there was literally 10 of us but because there was two already in. But I was like, you didn't tell me that. Mm-hmm. You didn't say to me. And even to be having the conversation, I'm standing behind my husband's coffin. 
And I said that to him. I was like, hang on. I'm walking into the crematorium after my 37-year-old husband's coffin. Are you serious? And he was just like, oh, let's go. <laughs> but I didn't realise there was a conversation going on in the background mm. where um, I there was two people step aside. Yeah, so it was awful. Yeah, in 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Fit it all. Fit 37 years into 20 minutes. They were told to go fuck themselves on that point. Mm-hmm. But that's... But I didn't tell them. But I literally, I was like, no, no, no. Stuart is not going to be rushed. He had his songs that he wanted. He had his way. And that's... Stuart was going to be... There was justice going to be done for Stuart. Mm-hmm. 37 years doesn't go into 20 minutes. It doesn't. End of story. Um, but we've done our best and gave him a send off, but it's not the same. Mm. It's the one thing that I've anger over that I see big funerals and I, I don't like them. And like, it's not that I don't like them. I find them upsetting. I'll stand and I'll think, sure, I never got this. I was in company about six weeks after the funeral because that's when people were allowed to start coming together. And somebody said, you know, this family's out there having funerals of six and ten people at them. And I was sitting there and I was like, that was me. But that's when I realised because that person hadn't first hand experienced Stuart's funeral, they forgot. They mm-hmm. forgot he passed away. And because he wouldn't be at so many family events and things like that, they forgot. And I was like, wow. And I can remember walking into the room and nobody saying to me. They were all, nobody mentioned it. They hadn't seen me. But they were terrified. And like, do I begrudge it to them? No. Was it the wrong thing to do? Absolutely the wrong thing to do. You never mm. ignore somebody that's just lost. But they ignored me. Like, they didn't ignore me. It was just like, They ignored hey, the situ. Mm. Hey. And I was like, and I can remember sitting down and being like, did Stuart exist? Did that all happen? Did that like, but I know they were only, I can see it now. Did it make mm. me angry at the time? Absolutely. And oh. this is why I think the group is yeah. so important because each of you have your own perspective. Yeah. yeah. Um. And I won't talk too much about each of you because I'll have each of you on. Um, because I think it's really important to keep sharing these stories mm-hmm. and about the group. Um, so, and I want to talk about what else you've got planned. But oh, yeah. the group is where? So the group is in Swords. It's in a hall. Uh, it's Brackenstown. It's base is what it's called. Um, it's a setup where it's come every Wednesday, come one Wednesday a month, come every six months. There's no booking required. You come in, you have a cup of tea, and you sit down. There's usually around 10 to 20 people in the room. It tends to be more closer to the 20 that come into the room. It's different people each week. We do have our core people that tend to go every week. But there's other people that do tend to come every three to four weeks. It's a gorgeous environment. And it has been so healing to me. And I'm only four years into my journey. But it gives me a space to be Stuart's wife and grieve so that I can then go out into the world as Louise because I want to rebuild my life and I want to have a full life. So the group gives me a space where I can come in and say somebody's annoying me or this is like, I'll give you an example. Two weeks ago, I was in town with my mom and my sister-in-law. We're in Arnott's. I'm never in Arnott's. And I turn around and I can hear someone calling my name. And there was a girl there who had her liver transplant the same day as Stuart. Mm. And we're really good friends, but she lives the other side of the country. Mm. And I was like, oh my God, it's amazing to see you. And it was like, I was like, this is the most beautiful surprise. And I said goodbye to her and she headed off and I came back in and I sat down in the restaurant and I cried and I cried because I was like, I'm so, so happy for that girl. And she's the most beautiful person. But I was like, it was like a visual of that's where my life could have gone. And that's where my life went. It's, and it's, you don't begrudge it. That's the hard, but what's lovely is I got to go to group and be like, and I was waiting to go to group then to be mm. like, oh lads, this happened. And other people were able to share out that, that's similar to what happened to me. And it, it's just so nice to be in a space where I'm able to say it, mm. comfortable to say it. And there's other people that are only this, other people that are only a few short months and a few short weeks since they've lost people. And they're, coming and they're talking it's not a counseling service we cannot Mm. stress that enough we would not recommend this group as come here instead of going to counseling yeah they're two totally different things but do you want to talk do you want to have a cup of tea sometimes you just kind of feel like i've nowhere to go like i think they all think i'm mad i'd be up in jc's three and four times a day Mm. because some some days it's hard 
Mm. And it's some days it's hard. And I'm doing, I would think that I'm doing really well. But some days it's hard. Like, mm. I feel lost. I don't really, like you're 41, your friends are all busy. People have their own lives. And that's what happens when you grow up. Everybody has their own lives. You don't always want to be around your family. Mm. But there's that kind of, what do you do? Like, as you said as well, it's a place that you can kind of unboard and mm. that you're not like going, yeah. oh my God, if I bring this up again, or if I, yeah. you know, that you can be Stuart's wife in that room and literally walk out Louise. I know you're Louise here, but you're Stuart's yeah. wife and that's what you're there for and walk out yeah. Louise and try. Can I ask you, just yeah. really, before we move on to the retreat, about building your life and finding your identity. Is that really hard? Yes. It really is. And it's very much a choice. And I say it all the time. Um, There was about six weeks of, like I had, so I came home from the hospital the night that Stuart died and I took a turn. It's the only way I can describe it. My Mm -hmm. whole body, every muscle in it started to spasm and I still have a twitch because of it. So if I get really stressed, I'll start to tick. Do you know, like, Mm, like, yeah, yeah. and it's very, and then it used to happen every Sunday night. At the same time, because Stuart died on a Sunday night and I would start to build and I would be twitching and the more it would happen, the more wound up I'd get. And it was horrible. Um, and it was very stressful. But like, And I didn't really know what to be doing and I'd know where mm. to go because it was COVID. All I could do was sit in my house all alone. It was mm. next level, horrendous. But losing anybody at any point in time is horrendous. Mm. Um, but I have a really good friend who's friends with me a very, very long time. And she was going through a tough time. It's something else. And she was like, somebody said about sunrises. We start just doing sunrises. Mm. And I was like, fuck it. I can't sleep anyway. So Mm. I'll go. So we got up. It was, this was, because Stuart died in April. So it was starting to go into the summer. So it was really early. It was like three o'clock in the morning. And I was like, yeah, round. Yeah, we go and do a sunrise. So off we went to Port Marnock Beach. Done a sunrise. And it was the most spectacular moment and I stood with my feet in the water and the sun rose and I was like wow I'm alive like I get to see this and it was the first thing that kind of I know it sounds silly but it shook it shook me to being like you're still alive Mm. you're still alive so then I kind of became slightly addicted to the sunrises because it helped me sleep because I'd be so tired I would just keep going and I'd go to bed really early and then I'd get up really early but it kind of it shook me back Mm. into a routine so I became kind of addicted to that but my friend, I had so much paperwork that had to be done as well because I had to, there was house stuff and there was all sorts. It's not even important. But this is another thing that's covered in group that you can talk about things like that and be like, mm-hmm. this is happening to me. Did that happen to anybody else? All of these things that you don't necessarily have with other people. But she was, bring the journal. So I brought my journal and we'd sit on the beach and she'd be like, and we'd go and we called it Monday Mindfulness Club. Mm-hmm. And we'd go on the Monday and be like, right, by next Monday, I will achieve this. Now, it could have, like it started out with, I'm going to eat a breakfast every day because mm. we can't eat. I'm going to wash myself every day. Like, like when I say it started out that basic, it did. But it was amazing how quickly it turned around. Mm. And every Monday we'd look back on, oh, yeah, I did that. Oh, oh, no, I didn't do that. And it just started like that. And... I was going every single morning doing this, but we ha- we always had our Monday mind Monday mindfulness club, and then where am I going with this? Sorry, yeah. um, but that's what helped me get my routine. Yeah, your identity back. Yeah, but I went one morning, and it was so cloudy, there was no sunrise, <laughs> and I was like a fucking demon because I'd been having all these like beautiful yeah. sunrises, and I was like, I'm after getting up out of that bed so early. Mm. And then I realised, no, there was like this tiny pinch of sun came through the cloud when I was getting really annoyed. And I was like, uh, I know it sounds so cliche, but for me, it was like I realised even though the world is full of clouds and it was kind of, I felt it was like a paradox, mm. that the sun is still rising in the background. Mm. And that was like my life, that uh, the sun was still rising for everybody else. But my life was the cloud that I just couldn't see it. And someday it'll part and the sun is going to come true again. And it did. Mm. I got into walking. I would walk and walk and it's funny because this winter Mm. starting up the group the one thing that fell away was the walking and the one thing that I've decided I was like no no I have to get back to my walking Mm. it's where I sort my brain out it's where I sort everything I process it sometimes it can be the most simple thing but somebody else might be colouring yeah there's a 
it's knitting so like the amount of different things that have been suggested in group but you're like mm. oh yeah i can see that i can understand that um but the sunrise for me was that was mine the first step that you were like okay i'm gonna reclaim this as my own i'm gonna reclaim this as louise yeah yeah and I kind of and it's funny because i so the day stuart died he created a playlist for me oh god so yeah Oh, and I still have that. And whenever oh I go and do a sunrise, I I'll say it's like a, it's like a meditation because I say mm. to it, play a song for me today, and boom, it'll hit you like a ton of bricks. What it like what comes in? But yeah, I love that. I love that he created the playlist for me, and there must be about a hundred songs in it. And yeah, he just he was very sick that weekend, and on the Sunday morning he woke up at half five, and he was in the best form. And he was like, get my phone, start putting these songs into it, make a playlist. Make a Louise and Stuart playlist. Oh. We did, yeah. He done all of that. He planned his whole funeral. Funeral, planned what he was going to wear. He wore a purple tracksuit and gold crushed velvet shoes. He was, <laughs> he was the man. But uh, no, he did. He was. I I always remember sitting in the room with them, and Paul Brady was one of our uh, wedding songs, mm. and it was uh, the Lakes of Pontchartrain mm. was was the song. So Stuart was falling back asleep after doing the playlist and he said, I'll put on Paul Braid, put on our song. So I put it on and he closed his eyes and was going to sleep. And I can remember it hitting me that he was going to go. And I can remember crying and the heartache. And I can still like, I still haven't really listened to that song. Music is very powerful Mm. in that sense. And I remember a cleaner coming in and putting her arms around me and saying, just let it out. And it was probably the nice, one of the nicest hugs I've ever had in my life. And I think strangers can be the most powerful thing in helping you release. And mm. that's why I hope a sip of support as a group can do different things. It can be that stranger that mm. will help. And I I think for me, there has to be a purpose in my life going forward. And that's why I set out to do the sip of support group. And it's called a sip of support because of Stuart appreciating every sip of his coffee in the morning. It's and, amazing. Yeah, and it's a purple logo because he was in a purple tracksuit and... Tell me about the retreat. So the retreat is next, I'm going to say next Saturday, it's Saturday Mm. the 10th of February in the White Sands Hotel in Port Marnock. It is a beautiful day that we have planned. We have Fiona's Flourishing Therapy speaking in the morning. So it's going to be a very, like, there's two or three nice things happening in the Mm. morning, but we do have a lovely speaker there. There's going to be conversations. And the way we're looking at it is that in the morning we're going to, offload everything and then in the afternoon it's all about healing so we have a lovely restorative um yoga celine is coming to do that we also have a section on journaling and then we're going to have a cacao ceremony and a little wishes ceremony as well there's other little bits and pieces going to happen throughout the day um and there's some amazing companies have donated really fabulous gifts of how like of self-care gifts Mm. so a really uh, nice gym has given two one month memberships so that if you're struggling to kind of get into that maybe see if that works for you yeah but like that it's there's there's going to be the different gift bags of things Mm. like that and we don't know who's going to get what but I look at it like there's somebody coming on the day they're supposed to get that and Mm. they're supposed to use it Mm. they're supposed to see how it goes because I don't believe that there's any accidents in this life and anybody that's going to be there on the 10th of February they're going to be exactly where they need to be and Fiona is going to say something or Celine is going to say something or somebody else in the room is going to say something that will change their lives and I know that that sounds so like it's just we're all here even different things that you'll say Rebecca will change Mm. how I look at life and my perspective on it Mm. and so important to have conversations so that we're doing that and all the girls involved all the girls so I have to say I'm blessed I wanted to set up a sip of support and I didn't know what way to go about Mm. it or what to do and I bumped into Sharon by accident in JC's and we had a conversation and she came on board and then Marie and I were friends from doing the grief retreats with Kathy Stritch who Mm. does the most amazing grief retreats and that's pretty much where the it's not that it, it came, but it was, I saw the value that I mm. got from it. And I was like, I need that every week. And I'd been searching for it and I found it in Connemara. And I was like, well, that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. I can't be up and down to Connemara every mm. weekend. And that's why I just thought we'll, we'll try and kind of get some type of community together. And it has worked. It has worked. But it, it wouldn't work if I didn't have Sharon, Marie, Audrey and Fiona by my side. Each one of us brings a different type of it's not about having types of lost, but but, but it is. Oh, no, it is. Mine is parental and spouse. Marie is parental. 
Sharon is parental and sibling. Audrey is sibling and lots of, and parental. And also there's child loss as well. There's so many different losses. But that's the different types of conversation that come into the room. Mm. And they're the most beautiful people that do come into the room each week. So maybe you're going to be listening to this podcast after the 10th of February. I'd ask that you would follow the Instagram page Mm. and come some Wednesday night. Take Mm. a chance. You're going to be welcomed. There's the most, they're just a gorgeous bunch of people. And we all just have a cup of tea and a conversation and we share and we offload and then you go home and you get on with the rest of your week and you, you build your life and you do learn off other people. Mm. You know, that's, that's all I get. Like it's, you learn off other people. Like I'm in the room and there's a lovely person that comes each week and they're 13, 14 years down the road, spousal loss. And I learn so much from them. And I like they inspire me because I'm like they're still going and it's like Mm. and it's not that oh they're still coming into a room to talk about because Mm. no matter what I'm going to be 70 and 80 and I'll still talk about Stuart Stuart will always be my husband I will always be his wife I hope I have a I hope I meet somebody I hope I have a whole other life but Stuart will always still be Mm. a huge part of it it's like you see other people on Instagram and their lives have transformed after loss but they always still, they, there's always still that part that goes back to the person. Because I am only who I am today because I met Stuart MacDonald and I got to be his wife. And I got to experience that road and he showed me what it was to live. He did. And on that note, we leave it there. Yeah. Thanks, Louise. Thanks so oh. much for coming and sitting down. And best of luck with the retreat, honestly. And, you know, you're the four, four, one, two, three, five, four or five. five of you yes. are such powerful women, like mm. such powerful women to do what you do. So congratulations. Thanks. And it's it's not Keep profit it. and it's 50 euro yeah. a ticket. It's yeah. for nothing and you're going to get such a special day and your lunch is included. Yeah. <laughs> I know. No, but I know, but we need mm. to say, you're, like you're such incredible women and, you know, you, you need to keep this. And, you know, I know you've said this to me before, like, you know, you feel that with the funeral with Stuart um, but this is his legacy as well yeah, yeah you know? absolutely absolutely and yeah I love to introduce him to people and I probably didn't do him half the justice that he deserved but you'd be needing to be here about 15 hours and you'll always keep going doing yeah, it as well exactly. Louise thanks so much oh thank you very much